Pirates have a certain romanticism in the collective psyche of man. Everyone immediately has a picture in their mind of what a pirate looks like. You. Think of it right now. There's a few things that stand out, isn't there? Long, dirty hair. An eye patch. A really big tripoint hat. Maybe even with a skull and crossbones. Maybe even some really fetching frilly sleeves. A peg leg. Many of you are probably picturing Johnny Depp. No, I was picturing a crappy Captain beard. Jack Sparrow. What about Parrot? Oh, yeah, Parrot. We're That's too- a good one. But what I bet none of you pictured was a woman. Pirates are almost always depicted as men. And in reality, that was pretty much the case. Most pirates were men. But there were some notable examples of women that bucked the trend on the high seas. This week on Cheeky Tales, I'm going to guide you through three of the most badass female pirates the world has ever seen. All right, first take. Good job, boys. Could you say that these female pirates fucking need the trend? Sure, I would. I wouldn't, but you could. Have you ever thought of female pirates? I have, yes. and not just at Halloween. No, I have. No, constantly. Every time I've watched pirates, because you're going to talk mm-hmm. about the one I know about, and I love Kira Knightley. You're thinking of uh, Cheng Shi or whatever yes. her name is. Yeah, I'm not talking about that one. Really? Because she should be her own episode. Oh, okay. So yes, I'm not talking All about right. the Chinese pirate lord Chen Shi. Yeah, that's Chen the Sarah. one I know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, good. I'm not talking about her, but I, I'm very glad that you mentioned her because I was going to have to anyway. What about Edward Conway? Nope. Yeah. Oh, boo. Oh, come on. Boo. He doesn't get it. No, I don't. No, he <laughs> doesn't get it. <laughs> don't tell him. I won't. But uh, <laughs> I will say two things triggered me to do this episode, and mm. one of them is a very cheeky tales thing. Um. The first one was- We're doing ships. It is ships, yeah. Um, no, one, <laughs> another podcast that did the history of pirates. Yeah. Shout out to Short History Of. Uh, and they mentioned female pirates in that, not in depth, but they mentioned them. And secondly, last month, or the month that we're recording this, which is why it's still relevant, is Women's History Month, International Women's History Month. So I thought, what, what better time to do this episode? Then probably two weeks late in April. But, you know, <laughs> we're recording in March, so there you go. Thought that counts. <laughs> um, yeah, so pirates. Know much about them? Outside of what you see in movies? Um, I think so. Mm-hmm. Everything I know about pirates is pretty stereotypical, though. Much like my research into the Wild West that I incidentally did after a podcast episode where, in fact, it wasn't really that wild. It was mostly just pretty normal people doing pretty normal things. Yeah. But we romanticize it. I've always imagined that piracy is a lot more romanticized than normal. When you think about the elaborate clothing they're depicted as wearing, the There's reality no of that, that, the reality of that is they would have never worn that. A lot of those very decorative coats that would have morphed into the pirate coats would not have survived at all. They probably just wore very normal clothing of the time. Yeah. I think Vikings are getting that treatment now. They are getting that treatment. Oh, yeah, they've been are, getting it for years. Man, did, if you've never watched Cheeky Tales listeners, Chiquitos, Tartars, as I'm calling my fans, <laughs> and, and line of my sign off line, Tartars. if you've never watched Is it overly- his fans called Slappers? No. <laughs> Boo. Um, if you've never watched overly sarcastic productions, um, yeah. those guys are where I get a lot of my history stuff from because they really have the time and effort to go in depth. And they cover a lot of the sort of stuff that they, they, they talk about, like, this is the reality of what it actually was versus what we think it is. Highly recommend looking into that. Um, speaking of pirates, I remember playing a pirate game with you, Sean. Yes. And I did something that upset you very much. That was almost <laughs> all the time that we played Sea of Thieves. But go on about the specific <laughs> one. Was it shooting is. me out of the cannon? No, no. it wasn't was shooting it- you out of the cannon. <laughs> what was shooting it, Shooting the dog out of the, the cannon. The dog out of the cannon. <laughs> <laughs> can, 
can we see of thieves for a cheeky plays? Because that sure. is a very funny game. Sure, sure. That sounds like a good idea. That sounds like a Let's good idea. That. And it's if on you're games pass. on PlayStation now, soon it's coming to you. If you're one of the Xbox p- games coming to PlayStation, we could we could tie in cheeky plays with the thematics of an yeah, episode. We could. we could do a really good one. Now I've got to do a trucks podcast. Trucks. Trucks. <laughs> We could do we could do bombers. Red Dead. We could do Red Dead for bush ranging. Yeah. Um. There's that. What's that? Bo- there's like a bomber game. Bomber. bomber crew. Yeah. Bomber crew. Or really any of the. There was Which a lot is, of World War Two fighter plane yeah, games. But like bomber crew is like a, a overcooked type of thing where you're running around quickly trying to do stuff. Yeah, that'd be cool. Well, what's a pirate anyway? Why? Someone who illegally downloads movies or TVs. You wouldn't download a house. Well, you should know. <laughs> you should know. You should know what a pirate is. Come on, yeah, you're, a, a, you're a human. It's a sea criminal. But there it's are, a sea bush ranger. It's a sea it's bush, an ocean bush ranger. It's yeah. an ocean. It's an ocean ranger. But there are some little things you might need to know about pirates before we get started. Firstly, ar ar me hearties. Firstly, pirates are people who use a ship or fleet of ships to rob other ships, generally merchant vessels. What? Nothing. Just fact checker Sean getting ahead of himself and discovering information that's too funny. Okay. We'll save that to the end of my wrap up on pirates. Piracy has existed as long as stuff has been loaded onto ships and floated around. And as we know, thanks to Tom Hanks, still goes on in the world today. I am the captain now. Look at me. When you think of pirates, the whole aesthetic and the big ones you've heard of, like Blackbeard and Captain Morgan, come from the end of the 1600s and the start of the 1700s. You mean the drink Captain Morgan yeah. is a real person? Yeah. Yes. It was only recently I discovered Blackbeard was a real person. I thought mm-hmm. Edward Black- Teach. Black- yep. Blackbeard, but Blackbeard Black was blop. a story. Blah, blah. Mm. Um, Black, blah. Yeah. He put little uh, candles and stuff in his beard so it'd smoke up. Mm-hmm. Cool. Look more terrifying. Yeah. yeah. Um, we mentioned before, Sea of Thieves is a great pirate game. Oh, One of my other favourite games is a pirate game. Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Mm. Very good game. Very fun game. I spent a lot of time cruising the Caribbean. Well, that's where all these pirates come from that you know of. Blackbeard, Captain Morgan, whatever. 16, 1700s in the Caribbean. Yes, that is where the movie is set. Uh, there are also yep. a special kind of pirate. He's talking about pirates of Penzance. Yep, that's the ones. You're talking about pirates of Penzance. Pen? Pen- no, Penzance. Huh? Penzance. Yeah. Yeah, the musical. Yeah, oh, that's thought, what John said. Yeah, I thought I said Punsum. I'm like Punsum, oh. like Punsum, like pirates of Panzer. Pirates of Gundam Wing, like <laughs> Panzer Wing. So Caribbean pirates mm. are actually a special kind of. Pirate. Are they the ones that have the little like? Clips on them, like Caribbean pirates. Carabina pirates. Oh, okay, oh, sorry. Caribbean pirates. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's one B. This is etymologically. No, this is pirates who operated in the Caribbean at this time mm. are called buccaneers. Ooh, and yeah. that's where my favourite team comes from. Our whole lives are a circle because it all comes together. Mm. Many pirates of this era started out as privateers. By the cannons. Who are definitely pirates, but they are backed by a country with orders to attack an opposition country's ships during wartime. So that's a privateer versus mm-hmm. a pirate. Mm-hmm. They pretty much had free reign to do all the looting and murdering that pirates do, but only on one side of the war, uh, and would try. And the other side would try and kill them, uh, while the other just loved them. At the end of the war, they would lose their free pass to do the killing and stealing, but would often not stop. And transition pretty nicely into just being a straight up pirate who would now be hunted by the very country that supported them just a year ago. And the major players, like countries in that time? It's like England, France, Spain, yep. Portugal. Yeah. Mostly it's the English in the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. But, and uh, the Spanish? I thought the Spanish had a very heavy yeah, there was. presence. Further south. Is Spain and Portugal and right. yeah. Yeah. And then there were some Puerto Rican born pirates in the, the latter era as mm-hmm. well. So they were born locally within the Caribbean and the Bahamian region. Bahamian. West Indian region. Can you look up? Yes. I've gone back to Black Flag. 
What was the female pirate in Black Flag? Oh, God. Thank you. Lastly, most of what we know about pirates of this era comes from a book published in 1724 called A General History of Pirates. That's pirates with a Y, not an I. Written by someone calling themselves Captain Charles Johnson. While it's somewhat accurate, it does take quite a lot of artistic license in describing pirates, romanticising them and adding a lot of the tropes that I described earlier. It's also the first instance that we know of where the skull and crossbones flag was given the name Jolly Roger. Mm. So pretty much the whole aesthetic of pirates that we know came yeah. from this one book. Yeah, right. And it's not 100% accurate about oh. what they did. Yeah. So Captain Hook is not. They likely did not have- uh, Hook hand. No. Or peg legs or mm. missing eyes. If you had a missing eye, they'd kind of be annoying on the ocean. Is it the Simpsons? Oh, mate, it's got like the two peg arms and the two peg legs. No, that's Family Guy. Oh. Now that you know what a pirate is and a buccaneer mm-hmm. and a privateer, mm-hmm. buccaneer is not important. I just wanted to reference it again. Yeah, of course. Not, not coarse hairs? Coarse hairs. Coarse hairs. Coarse hairs are like the other side going after the pirates. Mm. Did you know that? That's why Corsair, the company, their logo is a ship. Did not know that. I, I just it's on think- the headphones you're wearing right now, if you would turn your head and show everyone. That's right. The cheeky verse strikes again. I was thinking of the Dun. World War II plane. Dun. The F4. F- no, not F4. Dun. It's an F4 Phantom. It's an F4 Phantom. What's the, the Corsair? Something else. Something else. F something or other. Big blue boy that folds their wings up like that. Cute. Launch from a carrier. Yeah. Pirate Lady One. Yes. Grace Mm -hmm. O'Malley. Mm -hmm. Another O'Malley? Ooh. Sorry if your last name's O'Malley. You do not have good heritage, Bush Rangers. Are you saying the Irish aren't good? No. As I'm sure you can tell by the name alone, Grace O'Malley was born in Ireland in around 1530. In Dublin? Not in Dublin. <laughs> Her father, Ewan Dub- Ewan Dubhadara. Don't even Dubhadara. try to pronounce the Celtic name. Oh, I'm going for no, it. You were going to get it wrong. Yeah, I know. His last name was O'Malley. You know- It's not really because her name wasn't even Grace O'Malley. No, this is her father. You know, one of my children has a Celtic inspired name. Kean. Hmm. Mm-hmm. The traditional spelling. I was like, William? <laughs> the traditional spelling is C-I-A-N, as in like- We've just totally doxxed two of your kids, by yeah, the way. Whatever. What? <laughs> so, her father was the chief of her family's clan, mm-hmm. uh, who were a seafaring clan with the motto, Terra Marquis Putens, or Valiant by Sea and Land. The family would make money on the sea by, you guessed it, piracy, and the process of gathering black rent- or protection money from those who fished off their coast. As you can imagine, Grace was brought in on the family trade as a wee lass, and so would learn how to navigate the seas and threaten local fishermen from a young age. As I've already said, it was pretty unusual for women to be on pirate ships, and even more unusual for women to have jobs at all in most cases. So, when you say unusual, we get the line from that movie that says it's bad luck to have a a woman on board. I, I think there was probably stuff like that floating okay. around, yeah. Um, what was that character? you got to remember that this is the time where it was like women stay at home. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Mm. So legend has it that the way that Grace managed to find her way on board a ship to learn in the first place was through the classic Mulan trick Ooh. of disguising herself as a man. Have you got that name from Assassin's Creed? Yes, I have, but I'm not going to talk about it because I think Aaron's already going to talk about it because okay. it's based on a real person. Okay. Is it this person? No. Oh. Continue me hardy. So, yeah, she disguised herself. <laughs> Happy with that one? No. You want to re-roll? No. We haven't done okay. a pun in a while. I did buccaneer the trend. That was my pun. Well, oh, that's pretty light. That's pretty thin. Anyway, she did the classic Mulan trick, disguised herself as a man. Um, she apparently cut off her hair in an attempt to fool everyone. And I guess it worked because she ended up on the ship with the nickname Grace the Bald. Huh. So she went like full cut her hair off. Yeah, yeah shaved right. it. No one would ever suspect a woman with no hair to be a woman. I, I Maybe in this time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, while the family trade would be to steal, and ta- uh, steal from and tax those on the sea, Grace would find another way to make coin. Marriage. 
Her first marriage would come when she was just 15 years old. Wouldn't that give away the fact that she's a woman? Well, it was already obvious. Yeah. She, okay. she cut off her hair to get on the ship because oh, okay. her dad said that her long hair. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then she would have just become Grace again. Okay. So at 15 years, uh, she married <clears throat> Donal and Choiga O Flaith Bahate. <sighs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's how it's spelt. Yeah. Um, it's just pronounced O There you go. Is how it's pronounced. Really, really close. So he was the heir to the uh, chief of the clan O'Flaherty. Yep. Uh, this would clearly have been a good match for the two, uh, with the combination of their families ruling a huge area. You should know about this name O'Flaherty because they're the predominant clan in Galway. Ah. Mm-hmm. Sean and I a while ago decided we were going to get really into hurling. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware. This he is, was aware of that, yeah. This is like three or four years ago. And okay. I've, you've never mentioned it since. These people don't know that. Oh. Every Irish person that comes <laughs> in the barbershop, just we like, talk about You want to talk about I know. Don't tell me again. Don't ever mention it again. <laughs> it defeats the purpose of the podcast. <laughs> Anything I already know, never mention it. <laughs> Go home, John. You're drunk. <laughs> so, John, anyway, you a bot. Sean and I decided we were going to be into hurling. It's really hard to watch. We stopped listening to it, but- we always talk about Galway now when every chance we get. Yes. Thanks for playing along, boy. <laughs> <laughs> or Mayo. The county of Mayo is a good one as well. So, uh, <clears throat> Grace would end up having three children in this marriage. Owen, Maeve, and Murrow. I was really dropped an anchor on this, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, he really did. Before There's my Don- plan. I got it in. <laughs> Sean loved it. <laughs> Before Donald was tragically killed in an ambush while hunting in 1565. 19 years into their marriage. Hunting what, whale? No. I think he was hunting on land. Oh, no wonder. He's a, he's a water folk. He's a sea creature. He's a sea creature. He went to an unnatural habitat and got killed. Donal had been killed as part of a battle between his clan and the clan Joyce for control of a castle. And at the time of his death, Grace was in residence in the castle. The clan Joyce obviously thought that uh, with the man out of the way, they would be able to steamroll the castle and win it back but they had not considered that Grace was battle-hardened herself. She would fight back the clan, forcing them to retreat. She would then return to her family's lands, now with a taste for vengeance, and with a fleet of ships left uh, by her husband, a castle and a cavalry that she brought with her that were in awe of her fighting skills and sailing talent. So she's got married to this guy, lived happily, he gets killed, now she's got a bunch of ships, she's battle-hardened, she's got a army that was loyal to her husband. <laughs> that was weird, wasn't it? <laughs> Apollo just ran Apollo just ran around here, scooted his butt, and then just <laughs> ran over there. Uh, Grace would then take a lover in the form of a shipwrecked sailor who was then killed by the clan McMahon. Facing tragedy again, she wouldn't went, wallow. He just went from the luckiest guy in the ocean to how long? It wasn't long. Are you quite right, buddy? <laughs> Pollard <laughs> took a poo and now look at him go. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Apollo's making his debut. <laughs> Here he is on the podcast again. Wow. Okay. Uh, can't wait for that to end badly. So, yeah, it, it did not last long. Uh, he was killed very shortly afterwards. Mm. Um, so, she would end up leading an attack on the Clan McMahon's Doona Castle, killing her lover's murderers and earning herself the nickname the Dark Lady of Doona. Ooh, that's, that's a great nickname. Yeah, pretty sick. The Dark Lady of Doona. Yeah. That's, that's cool. Better than Grace the Bald. Yeah, yeah you know mm. what? Yeah. Yeah. Grace would then marry for a second time in 1566 to a man named Richard Burke. And this marriage seemed to be a strategic move, as Richard had a land army and a castle that Grace wanted to get access to. They had a child. Uh, oh, it was like Tibbo or something, or Tib- Tiboy. Sorry, say again, with her marriage to Burke. Yeah, Tibbo Burke. Yeah, but it wasn't pronounced that way. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, his name meant like... Boy of the oh, Sea or it's something. it's anglicised as Theobald Burke. 
Yeah. But it seemed that Grace wasn't that interested in a long-term romance with Richard, as just a year after their marriage, she yelled from a window, Richard Burke, I dismiss you, in what just seems like the least effort way to get divorced. He sounded like a bit of a dick anyway. Bad? (laughs) Good one. Thank you. They would stay lifelong friends and co-parents, though. Oh, well. uh, But would only be married on paper. Maybe not such a bad dude. As a side note, Grace would give birth to Thibaut on a ship and hours later would take part in defending said ship from an attack. Pretty dope. Probably a legend. I can't imagine she was up to getting up and fighting at that point. Uh, Maybe. I know women who've given birth and then, well, they'd started cooking a roast dinner, gave birth and come home and finished cooking roast dinner. Okay. That's a pretty dope effort. Yeah. Start pumping them through once they get to like three and four. (laughs) Downtime is... Way less. Pumping them out. Yep. That happens. We get pros at it. I mentioned earlier that Grace's family would charge black rent to ships in the area. Mm -hmm. It's worth noting that this was a response that Grace implemented when she took over the clan after her father's death in 1553. She would take issue with the English taxing her legitimate businesses and so would take to building castles on the seaside to monitor the passing ships and then chase them down to shake them down for money. If they didn't pay, she would raid them, killing those aboard and taking the goods. Good old classic pirate stuff. And then probably adding that ship to her fleet. Probably, unless she just sunk it. Yeah. Despite the constant piracy against English ships, she would even end up having a little bow-wow with Queen Elizabeth I to get help with an annoying local governor. She had been having issues with a bloke called Richard Bingham, not Richard Burke, that was the husband, who was the English governor of Western Ireland. Richard had become quite paranoid that Grace was resisting English rule of Ireland. Probably a founded worry, uh, considering she kept raiding all of their ships. Richard had taken a bunch of Grace's property and land after an Irish rebellion, but it wasn't until Richard took her sons captive that she did anything about it. Ooh, that's a mistake. Yes. But- You're you're taking the children of the dark lady of Doona. She went about it a different way, though. (laughs) Flaming pigeons. She would sail to England to meet the Queen in person, where she would refuse to bow for the Queen as she didn't recognise her authority. Somehow, Grace would convince the Queen to offer to intervene in the situation with the Governor on the condition that Grace swore not to rebel. Grace would return to her land, now hers again, and spend the rest of her life either fighting against English incursion on her activities or fighting for England to prove that uh, her oath to the Queen. Confusing stuff. But she never really gave up the piracy. When you said she refused to the queen. Refused, refused to, to bow. bow. I feel like I've seen that in a TV show recently. Probably. It's probably a very common, like, theme. No, it was a, it was a woman saying something about, I oh, refused to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, and didn't bow. A- apparently it's a bit of a- yeah. Bit of a myth? A- it, it's not a bit of a It could be a myth. Many of what Anne Chambers refers to as fanciful tales have embellished the story of the meeting of the- of, of them in the Irish storytelling tradition, I never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Mm. <laughs> For example, O'Malley is said to have refused to bow before Queen Elizabeth because she did not recognise her as Queen of Ireland. It was said that she had a dagger concealed on her person, which guards found upon searching her. Yeah. yeah it's all a bit messy, isn't it's it? It's a bit, it, yeah, fanciful even. Mm. I love it but though. that is the Dark Lady of Duna, mm. Grace O'Malley. Still a great name. Mm. Her son was the, f- Thibaut was the first Viscount of Mayo. Like, he was very important. Mm. Mayo being the cursed county of Ireland. Probably. Is that the one that has never won? They haven't won since they interrupted the funeral. That's right. It's probably going to happen soon because all the players are dead now. Ooh. Grace O'Malley. Yeah, so that's Badass. Grace. Second lady pirate, Anne Bonny. Love the name. The second of our scurvy fighting women has an unknown birthday and origin. Mm. She is said to have been born in County Cork, Ireland. She was a daughter of a servant, Mary Brennan, with her father being Mary's employer, William Cormac. Cormac had a wife. Dog. What are you laptop and John? I'm just trying to find out this TV show that I saw. I'm listening. So Anne was an illegitimate daughter of William. It's not great for the- 
video of you looking up about a TV show. Yeah, no, it's all good. Why don't you just ask him to do it? Because I've got a, a mental picture I'm trying to find. Okay. So, yeah, Cormac, bit of a dog. He had an affair with his servant. Mm-hmm. Had this illegitimate daughter. Mm-hmm. He would end up moving to London to get away from his wife's family. But it seems that taking the illegitimate daughter and his side chick wasn't a great move. As his, was the family coming after him? Uh, I don't really know. It just sounded like he didn't like the family. Yeah, okay. But his wife found out uh, about the side chick and illegitimate daughter moving with him and so cut him off from her money. So it sounds like she was the rich one. Mm. William would then try to make it as a lawyer but wasn't very good and so would move into buying and selling goods at the market, so working as a merchant, eventually making enough money to buy a plantation outside town. Unfortunately, Anne's mother Mary would pass away during this time. Anne would be seen as quite a catch, despite having a fiery temper that would result in accusations of stabbing a servant and setting her father's plantation on fire, among other things. Yeah, that does... (laughs) She would eventually marry a sailor and small-time pirate called James Bonney, who seemed interested in Anne to attempt to get her father's estate. This backfired, though, as William would hate the marriage between the two so much that he would disown Anne, which led to the aforementioned accusation of burning his plantation to the ground. Yeah, right. She seems like a, a pretty a bit of a, vengeful person. Yeah, a bit of a theme here, people burning stuff and mm. unfaithful. Yeah, that's piracy. Push raging. Yeah. Eventually, presumably to get away from her father and to get a new start, James and Anne would move to Nassau, also known as the Pirate Sanctuary or the home of the Republic of Pirates, sometime between 1714 and 1718. It's probably in the game, yeah. Is it in the game? It sounds familiar. I think it is, yeah. This was around the time of King George VII's proclamation for the suppression of pirates, which was a one-time offer of a complete pardon from the king if pirates gave themselves in before a specific deadline. This sounds very familiar. Mm -hmm. It's probably in Black Flag. Is this where Blackbeard comes into it? Blackbeard was kind of around this time. It was around this, yeah. Because he led- And like an attack on an English thing in like protest to this or something along those lines? Oh, yeah, probably. I didn't research Blackbeard all that much. It was a really- if the game is to be believed, yeah, which they take again artistic license, yeah, no, in real it, events. It was a really tiny window of time. There's mm. no way that Blackbeard could have mounted an attack in 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 respect. It was okay. like less than a year that they well, had. he was threatening to. Or something. Yeah, mm. and it, sorry. It also had bonuses in it for those who ratted on other pirates who refused to accept the pardon. James Bonney would take up the offer, being an absolute snitch for the king and giving up a number of his pirate mates to get a few bucks. Just a sneaky slug of a man. Yeah, just slugging about, sliding around. Slimy, sneaky. As it happens- Slug man. Anne wasn't very happy with her husband for doing this. Oh, tell me, he off, she offs him. As she had been becoming buddy-buddy with some of the pirates in the local tavern. Does she make him walk the plank? No. I was hoping this is where that come from. Anne had been spending a lot of her time at the local taverns and had found herself particularly enamoured by a pirate called John Calico Jack Rackham. Rackham was a very famous pirate and despite accepting the pardon, was still playing a, uh, planning on a big... Uh, ugh, man, what a poorly written sentence. He accepted the king's pardon and then just was like, I'm going to keep being a pirate. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> That name sounds familiar too. I feel like I've heard that name before, Rackham or Calico Jack. I feel yeah. like I've heard that before. Very famous. He yeah. was he was kind of the last of the big pirates. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Initially, Rackham offered James some money to divorce Anne, but when James was um, not so happy with that idea of accepting money for his wife, um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah. the two would flee with Anne disguised as a man back to the high seas. Anne would eventually have a child to Rackham and would divorce James and marry Rackham while at sea. Uh, Eventually, Rackham, Anne and another crew member would steal a ship called William and recruit uh, recruit another another crew to run that ship. Anne would eventually find out that another man on board was actually a woman named Mary Reed. And there is speculation that Rackham had suspicions that the two were lovers. Though, of course, it's pretty hard to find evidence of pirate love triangles. Mary Reed being, of course, the female pirate that they fictionalised for Black Flag. 
That, that's who I asked about that's before. The one. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. It's a lot of that happening. So in the game, Mary was a bit of a love interest to Edward Conway, mm-hmm. which is the the character pirate. in the the, the pirate, the yeah, protagonist, yeah, yep, mm. in Black Flag. Yeah, that would make sense. She's kind of, at least in this story, she's like this like flirty, loving. Yeah, um, she doesn't really matter much after this. Eventually, Bonnie, Reed, and Rackham would meet their match when they were over, uh, were attacked by Jonathan Barnett and his crew of corsairs, mm-hmm. who were working under commission from the governor of Jamaica. Barnett would attack in the middle of the night when the crew were absolutely slizzard from drinking all evening. Drinking rum? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually true. They yeah. did love a good rum. Okay, cool. They would all be captured with Rackham hanged for his crime. Reed and Bonnie would plead clemency or plead for clemency. Hung? Hmm? Hung? Hanged. That's also correct. Okay. Yeah. You wouldn't say I hanged it from my wall. Yeah. <laughs> hanged totally. is the- Hanged is the- Past tense verb of the action of hanging someone hung mm. is something entirely different. I know it sounds weird. It Long sounds drop weird. with a short rope. Yeah, mm. that's the one. Um, so Reed and uh, Reed and Bonnie would plead for clemency, stating they were both pregnant. Reed would eventually die in prison, assumably from fever brought on by childbirth. But Bonnie's fate is unknown. Some believe that she may have been released due to family intervention, though considering her father had disowned her, that seems unlikely. She may have died in prison many years later. She may have died in childbirth. All that we know for sure is that she wasn't executed, as there's no record of that happening. So a tasty little mystery. Very tasty little mystery. Mm. Ple- pleading their bellies, by the way, is actually a process within English common law which permitted a woman in the later stages of pregnancy to receive a reprieve of the death sentence until after she bore her child. Oh, interesting. The plea was available at least as early as eighteen, sorry, thirteen eighty-seven, and was eventually rendered <laughs> I was obsolete. Going to say thirteen weeks, <laughs> and was eventually rendered obsolete in have a stab at which year? Oh, it's going to be way too nineteen eighteen. Later, nineteen sixty-five. Earlier, nineteen forty. Thirty-one. Ah, oh, that's way too late. Which stated that an expecting mother would automatically have her death sentence commuted to a life imprisonment with hard labour. Wow. We love hard labour on Chica Tales Podcast. It comes up a lot. I think you're going to have a poo streak. Also, a carpet. slipping in with some Blackbeard stuff because we talked about that with the yeah. King's pardon. <clears throat> so, mm-hmm. about three or four months after the pardon got announced, Blackbeard heard about it. Did we mention Blackbeard's real name? Edward Thatch? Edward Teach. Uh, Teach, sorry. Blackbeard heard about it from uh, another ship that he was robbing. The Black Pearl? No. Oh. Um, and basically, Rob- it word got around and out of the 700 men within his uh, fleet, 300 of them were attempting to take a pardon. And then another guy that was coming through the area, Blackbeard was like, okay, you can go and do your thing. You're on your way to get pardoned. He went and did his thing. More and more people started deserting Blackbeard, basically. At one point, Stephen Bonnet and Blackbeard, Stephen Bonnet being the pirate that was coming through, and he was like, you can go and do that. They both ended up in the end, because they started losing people, taking the pardon, and then immediately went back to piracy, and they were eventually hunted down and killed. Sounds what like was the thing? point of taking the pardon? Six months of- I think they take, might have got taking the pardon. for it. No, you got, you got acquitted of all charges. Yeah. So fresh every, start. Yeah, you got a fresh yeah. start. But they went back to piracy because they were like, eh. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, if you're just going to go back to it, why even bother? Yeah, and then they were eventually hunted down and killed by the Virginia something or other. West Virginia. <clears throat> yeah. Mount Mama. Well, I was going to try and change the lyric to something about the ocean, oh. but it's too late for that now. Yeah. But that's Anne Bonnie. So mm. she was, um, there's a st- the story of like um, when they got attacked by the, cor- uh, the Corsairs, mm-hmm. um, she was just like mental on the ship, was like, like shooting them all. She wasn't drunk. She was pregnant. Oh. So she came up just like guns blazing. Bow, bow, bow. Yeah. Pirates. Pirates. <laughs> guns blazing with single fire weapons. Yeah. Bow, bow. Bow, bow. Yeah, but they had, they had six on. of them. It, they, they, they potentially had to, <laughs> yeah. We don't even know I half mean, of them even worked. I mean, that would have been smart, wouldn't it? To have like eight of them hanging off you. It so would you could- be. They're pretty heavy. Yeah. 
pretty ha- like they're flintlock. They're flintlock. They're yeah, solid I can't wood. Move, but I can shoot. Yeah, I, the, like the idea of also it would that no matter how well you did it, inevitably at some stage you tip it and all the crap falls out yeah. the end. So they were theoretically hanging barrel up, so they yeah. would have looked like terrible Christmas ornaments. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Not like all these cool tucked in, like, no. yeah. wow, they were like hanging upright. Excuse me for one moment. Let Clip. me just unhook Take it off my, my car. Uh, bang. Okay. Now, what about- oh, I dropped all my gun balls. Oh, not my gun balls. Bullets? <laughs> no, gun balls. <laughs> gun Chain- balls? To bring in a- oh, no. to, to bring in a bit from one of my favorite Clip TV it. shows. Gun balls. Clip it. To bring in a bit from one of my favorite TV shows, Cougar Town. Change approved. <laughs> now so, known as uh, gun balls. So, like, modern day bullets, are they like gun cones? And they're pointy balls. <laughs> Pointed balls. Because they're not really bullets, right? Yeah, Is, they are. Isn't bullet the shape? Not necessarily, no. Okay. I think bullets just whatever projectiles fired out of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about- the concept of a sword that had a gun in the handle. Was that a real thing? No. How would they? They could barely oh, okay. make swords. Mr. Fat Checker, who's not even going to check. While you do sword that. Sword with stupid <laughs> <laughs> gun in handle. <laughs> Zero uh, results. Anime. Anime. Uh, a weird handgun with a big knifey bit on it. A bayonet. And anime. No, it's okay. like a pistol with just a big chunk of steel on the okay. bottom of it. And more anime. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. It was just an oh, idea. What is the stupidest weapon? <laughs> That's also in the search. <laughs> that was my new favorite page. We're going to round Ooh. it out with uh, Jean de Clisson. French. Mm. We've moved away from Dublin. Last but definitely not least comes a vengeful woman who made the transition from nobleman to pirate. Noble woman? Yeah, I, I actually even wrote noble woman and then just said nobleman like a bigot. Before we get to Jean. Misogynistic prick. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was finishing your sentence. Wow. Before we get to Jean, we need to first understand the landscape that she lived in. Is it Jean? Or is Many it hundreds Jean? of years before the others. Uh, yeah, it is. This might not be a shock, but in the early 1300s, England and France were not exactly mates. What? Constantly at war and attacking each other as much as possible. What? Yeah, I know, right? In the 1300s, Brittany was a dukedom on the western side of France. Some of the people in Brittany swore allegiance to the English and some to the French, but above all, they were loyal to the Duke of Brittany. Sean, when was the Napoleonic Wars? The Napoleonic Wars. What they was- were like right at the end of the 1700s. Yeah, much, much towards much, the much end. Later. Yeah. Mm. yeah. They came after the French Revolution. Yeah, the early 1800s, okay. late, late 1700s, early 1800s, yeah. Easy way to remember it is the 1812 Overture was written about Napoleon's defeat with the with the Napoleonic War with Russia. Mm. Oh, okay. Yep. That's a good way, good way to like, okay, I know that happened then. Yep. When the Duke of Brittany died in 1341. Honestly, what has France done since? What's France done <laughs> since? Nothing. Cheese. I bread. mean, war-wise. What's war it wise. done? What, wait, what's it done? Like, what's it lost? What's it entered? What, what did it- commit? Well, it hasn't really- has it really fought anything since it Napoleon? World it War One, fought in World, World War, War Two, World War Two. They got pancaked really fast. I wouldn't class what they did in World War Two as fighting. So in World War One, they fought. They had a little bit of problems though. They got shot a lot because they wore blue, blue uniforms with really big hats. And then they built this massive fortification system, which the Maginot Line. Yeah, the, yeah, which didn't do much. Because against it, the Germans, it, they didn't finish it. Did no, they? they didn't finish. It. They yeah. or they didn't finish it. They didn't do it properly. That's what yeah. I mean. They haven't really done anything since Napoleon. Have they? Then there's the well. There's all the stuff with colonial French rule, uh, the, the French Indochina, Vietnam, like all the the ruling of that, 
which <laughs> lasted all the way up until World War Two, until the Japs came and went and took it all. The Foreign <laughs> Legion. That's what they've been pretty terrible since then. Charles de Gaulle. I mean, it was during World War Two. The leader of the French. It was fascinating. The leader of the French Revolution, but yeah, he wasn't oh, even yeah, in the France. Revolution. Yeah. Yeah, the man with the big nose. <laughs> Sorry, this is Don't point at me. What, you're Charles to go with a beard? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> so, when the Duke of Brittany died in 1341, there were two competing contenders to take over his dukedom. Charles de Blois. To go. No. Charles de Blois. Oh, fight, please. Okay, yeah, I can see that now. No, he's talking about Charles de Gaulle, as we know him. He's saying he it's looks Aaron. like me. Just tell me. He's right over. Wait, over here. Don't put the. I'm obviously going to put the photo in the shot. Ah, uh, Charles de Gaulle. <sighs> Why doesn't gonna... mine look like that? Uh, no, <laughs> go back, Sean. You keep telling the story and you just kind of like vibrate the screen a little bit like it's Aaron talking. Charles de Blois. <laughs> de, de Blois. De Blois. And Jean Montfort. The now dead Duke had named his niece, <laughs> Jean de Pantev, Pant- Pantev, as his successor. And she married Charles Can't de Blois. Difference. However, before his death, <laughs> uh, before the Duke's death, he had also named John of Montfort as his successor as well. This led to a 20 year war between France and England as the French backed Charles de Blois. <laughs> it, maybe it's de Bois. Anyway. They're, it's, it's, it's all, they're all the same name at this point. Everyone's B-L- named Charles or Charles. B L O I S. B L O I S. Yeah, De Blois. De Blois. Blastois. So, <laughs> the French backed Charles De Blois. Blastois. And the English black backed <laughs> John of Montfort. By the time of our story, the English had an upper hand in the conflict, seizing control of a number of important towns. Jean Louise de Belleville was born in 1300 in Vendée, France. That's not a full title. Come on, you absolutely can do not. All of it. I Jean removed the Louise rest. Jean Louise de Belleville de Clisson Dame de Montagu. Yeah, I removed most of that. Yeah, no, I couldn't help myself. She was born to nobleman Maurice Montagu and Latisse de Parthenay, <laughs> and the family would have invited. <laughs> would have been involved in winemaking, salt farming, and merchant work, which would have introduced the family to merchants shipping through the rivers nearby. Sean's what? lost it. Sean's lost it. Cheeky verse. Part of the reason I'm on this podcast is these <laughs> two's inability to pronounce things. <laughs> it's part of the reason I'm in this, and and- it's my favourite when we can't pronounce names. I'm glad it's not just me for It's once. not just you. Aaron has done it just as many times. Latisse de Parthenay, that's the name. <laughs> Parthenay? It's just such a funny word. Jean would marry three times in her life. First to Geoffrey de Chateaubriand, the eighth. Oh, it's got the nod. Who was a Breton nobleman. And the two would have two children. Mm, Breton just names. means from Brittany. Mm. Don't have the names. Not oh. important. Sadly, Jeffrey, Jeffrey and Louise. There you go. Oh, Sadly. Basic stock names. Dad Jeffrey would die in 1326, leaving Jean to marry Guy de Panthieu in 1328. <laughs> it's speculated. No, no. G- Panthieu. Pantor. Pantera. Pant- Guy de Pantera <laughs> in 1328. It's speculated that she may, may have married Guy to protect her underage children. But strangely, Guy's family would make a complaint with the Catholic Church to protect their heritage, as they wanted him to marry a de Blois. And the Pope would annul the marriage just two years later, leaving Guy to marry a de Blois, who was niece to Phil, uh, King Philip VI of France. De Blois. De Blois. De Blois. De Blois. De Blois. This is evidence that we shouldn't do any episodes on middle age, middle ages French stuff because we will balls it up. I do not say de bleu. De bleu. <laughs> I love that we're both doing the tongue bit. De bleu. De bleu. In, that was a Hotel Trends of anything. In 1342. Don't say bleu, 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 bleu. Wait, Sorry. I've skipped a whole paragraph. Wow. Go wow. Jeans, you Jeans forgot about it. third marriage gave her the name we know today. Mm. She would marry Olivier de Clisson oh. in 1330. Jean Leclerc. 
<laughs> Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> Olivier Fourth de Clisson. <laughs> a wealthy Breton who Space owned a pilot. castle. Ooh, what a, a really house. peculiar name. And mm. further land in the area. Must be nice. <laughs> Between the two, they had enough assets to be the senior lords of the Down area. with the rich. <laughs> Evict the rich. Not to be okay. Cheeky Tales, left leaning at all times, apparently. Cheeky Tales says, Viva la revolution. <laughs> and during their time together, they had five children. I don't know the names. Don't Isabeau, ask me. Maurice, Olivia the Fifth. G- Ooh, that's a hard one. <laughs> Guillaume and Jean as well. In 1342, Olivier would team up with Charles de Bleu, the French-backed contender, t- contender to the Duke de Contenia. You've got to get worse and worse for the rest of the podcast now. De Bleu. De Bleu. De Bleu. To help defend his claim to the throne. Mm. Declisson Castle would be chosen as headquarters by Charles de Bleu, lieutenant, <laughs> in 1342. What, what was the castle? Uh, it was just- uh, it was the the De Clisson. Oh, De Clisson. Yeah, and uh, it was Charles de Blair's lieutenant who chose it. And in 1342, the English would capture uh, Olivier when they took the city of Var. <sighs> Hang on. <laughs> the sigh. It's spelt veins. <laughs> Olivier. It is spelt veins. It'll be Vanet or something. Vanez. There's no, there's not enough pronunciation on how to say doesn't it. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Olivier would be the person released, uh, would be the only person released by the English after an exchange of prisoners and a suspiciously low sum of money. Olivier would find himself accused of handing over the city too easily and was accused of being a traitor and uh, preserving himself over defending the French interests. He would fall out of favour with Charles de Blais and the French king, and find himself rejected by the French. Get a bit. I should give a little bit of context for those that don't understand. The geography of this is really why it exists. The, the, the Duchy of Brittany is kind of like a peninsula. It, it's kind of- It like, just hangs off the side of France. It hangs off the side of France. If you were like drawn just circles of like, I live here, I live here, you're like, this is a random bit of land. It's kind of out on its own. Mm. So you can see how people that built things near the ocean and then built walls around themselves would have ended up being slightly different to everybody else. Yeah. (laughs) So by this point, Jean's husband is out of favour with the French because Mm -hmm. they think he's a traitor Mm -hmm. because the English gave him back for like a really cheap sum and he was the only person given back. In 1343, a treaty would be signed between the English and the French that would end the hostilities briefly. During this time, Olivier would be invited to a tournament on French soil. He was at the time not allowed to leave Brittany. And as the truce had been signed, he felt it would be safe to attend. He would subsequently be arrested and put on trial for treason. Jean would attempt to have him set free by bribing a king's sergeant and would be summoned herself to stand trial for disobedience to the king. Uh, She would evade arrest, making her way back to Brittany with the help of uh, their uh, his eldest son, which was not her eldest son. Uh, for Olivier, he wouldn't be so lucky, finding himself without a head after being found guilty, which sent shockwaves through the nobility as the evidence of guilt was not publicised. Not the guillotine. Uh. That was invented during the French Revolution. Um, so, yeah, it sent shockwaves through the nobility uh, as the evidence was not publicised and Olivier's body would be desecrated with Ooh. his head on a pike and his body in a gibbet. Oh, yeah, that was a common thing, wasn't it? The old head on the, on the pike. Not for nobility. Oh. That was a very common man thing to have happen to you. Yeah. Jean would obviously be outraged by this betrayal by the French king with not only the execution of her beloved husband, but the display of his body like a common criminal. So angry about it, she took her two young sons to see it. Yep. Wanting to instill a sense of anger and vengeance into her two youngest sons, she would take them to see the head on a spike, which understandably filled them with a lifelong rage towards the French. Jean would start selling off most of her assets to raise money to form an army of men who had been loyal to her husband. Pretty um, pretty metal thing to do. <laughs> like, hey, kids, I'm going to take you to see your dad's head on a pike on, so kids. that you have let's, a lifelong vengeance Let's go France. see dad. Yes. Oh, oh, by the way, it's just a head. Yeah, it's, it's dad's head. Yes. She would use this force that she uh, had just paid for to attack the forces of Charles de Blair and the French. A notable instance was the attack on a castle at Tofu, 
I think it's actually tofu. It's tofu. But it looks like tofu. She approached the gates <laughs> alone. Be a very strong castle if it was made of tofu. Uh, she would approach the gates alone in tears, and the commander recognised her and let her in to see what was wrong. She's Trojan horse. Yeah, it? at which point her forces sprung out and raided, massacring all but one person in the castle who was left alive to tell the tale. Oh, she's done that. Something that she would continue to do and become known for for the rest of her career. Leaving one person alive. Yep. Wow. As her reputation grew and she would face significant danger on land, Jean would pivot to the high seas, converting three merchant ships that she had to pirate ships, adding weaponry and gaining support from the British king. She is said to have painted the ships black Mm. and dyed the sails blood red, Mm. which, to be honest, sounds super badass. Just imagine, like, you're like, oh, I'm a 1300s... I'm just a merchant boy. I'm just here doing my stuff on a ship. Blood red sails I'm peak just, the horizon. All we've got to do is go across the English Channel to, to France and I'm going to be happy with all my money. Oh, what's that? Oh, no. This black ship with red sails comes up on you and you would have heard about it. Three of them. Yeah. And they're all just like circling you. Ugh. Uh, she also uh, called her flagship uh, the My Revenge. Huh? Yeah. Not very original, but not the worst. I mean, it's a black ship yeah. with red sails called My Revenge. It's not the Black Pearl. She would gain the nickname the Lioness of Brittany. <laughs> or the Flying Dutchman. Uh, the Lioness of Brittany mm. as she began her campaign of privateering, which we learnt earlier is state-backed piracy, and started attacking, sinking, and pillaging French merchant ships. Backed by the English? Yes. Mm-hmm. She would use her three ships to swarm an enemy, killing everyone on board with crossbows, swords, and axes, except one, which would, uh, she would apparently take great pleasure in doing the beheading herself with an axe. As always- Oh, so not leaving them alive. No, no. As always, she just enjoyed beheading people. Okay. But um, as always, she would demand that one victim be left alive to take the story back to the French king, always being sure to tell them that it was she who attacked them. Could you imagine- being that one person. Oh. Going terrifying. back, telling your story. Getting on another ship, being attacked. And How either you <laughs> and either being then killed, mm. like not being lucky enough to be picked again, but then or if you got picked again, where she goes, <laughs> Ah, did you tell him the story? Yeah, you're gonna have another story to tell. <laughs> oh man, they're gonna think it's me. <laughs> yeah. That'd be terrifying. She would continue her sea based warfare but would supplement it with raids on villages along the French coast. She would take supplies back to the English to help them on their campaigns and is even said to have helped with a few battles along the way between the English and the French. She would continue for 13 years before finally having her flagship sunk in a battle with the French, leaving her and her two sons adrift in the English Channel. That feels like a long time to be like almost constantly years. fighting yeah. and sailing. Yeah. It would take five days before they could be rescued. And her youngest son died during the ordeal. Oh, did they, did, did they eat him? No. Mm. Jean would retire at this point, marrying again in the 1350s to a man named Walter Bentley. How many, how many marriages is that? Four. That is four. Mm. And the two would live out their days in a castle on the Brittany coast. Oh, that's a castle. It must be nice. Yeah, I know, right? With Jean eventually passing away in 1359. And that's it. That's the history of three of the most badass female pirates of all time. They definitely weren't the only examples of female pirates, as we said earlier, Chen Shi. But they sure had exciting and interesting lives that deserve to live on through stories like ours. Awesome. And that is that. Um, yeah. Uh, they had very normal pirate lives, by the sounds of it. Um, their experience was very regular compared to other pirates, just sort of being a pirate, floating around, attacking mm. people. Um Although they didn't really, like, die at sea. Okay. Which was pretty normal for pirates. Um, Yeah, so she retired in the castle, the middle one, not sure, potentially died in prison. mm. And who was the first one again? Grace O'Malley. That's right. She just went back to living on the land. Living on the land. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Thanks, boy. That's all right. 
Uh, if you would like to see some slop slop lamental slop lamental slop lamental supplemental images, you can find them on our uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Cheeky Tales Pod at Charles de Gaulle Lookalike. Charles de Blair. <laughs> Charles de Blair. Um, yeah, hit us up there. Give us a follow so that you've got it in your feed. Uh, and share us with a friend. It'd be lovely if you could uh, find someone else to talk about our episodes with. Share us with a friend that likes piracy. Yeah. Or Orlando Bloom. Yeah. Kira Knightley. Yep. Or Davy Jones. Can't remember which actor played Davy Jones. That was Bill, Bill Nye. The science it guy. Was Bill Nye. <laughs> Little known fact, they used a lot of makeup. <laughs> it was Bill. <laughs> he really enjoyed that. He's so yeah, he's. he's Chuffed at that one. Oh, who was it? Was it, it was Bill someone. Um, I can see yeah. his face. Yeah, I can see his face. He was also in Harry Potter. He's in lots of things. He was also in Underworld. The guy that played Hagrid. It's also, no, he was also in Love Actually. Yep. Mm. Anyway, that is another episode. We'll see you in a fortnight. It's been lovely to speak to you. Enjoy hearing our voices again. It's been lovely to speak to you. Yeah. Stop changing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not working. I'm trying to land something. Anyway, good night. Just I read the dirty Just throwing stuff in the wall and hoping it sticks. Yeah, pretty much. That's what we do. <sighs> Ta-ta.